we'll, I don't know if we'll get through all of these, and even these are, are obviously not all of the questions you had, but um, maybe, so maybe we'll try and do some rapid fire answers. Um, here's a, uh, there were two about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I thought people might want to hear about that anyway. So one was, what advice did you give to JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis? I was not an advisor to JFK. I was a person working in the back room, studying the intelligence information that came in all during the day. And we were a small team of about six or seven of us. By midnight, we had prepared a report which told the president what had happened that day. And he used that as the first thing he read before, before he made his decision the next day. But I was in no way an advisor. I was only 33 at the time or something. But you, but you did tell him a number of important things. I mean, the, the, we did. And, and perhaps most surprising, maybe. We failed to do him something because we didn't know it. We failed yeah. to tell him yeah. that the Soviets, beside those medium-range missiles they were deploying in Cuba, had already deployed tactical nuclear weapons with authority to use them. And had Kennedy followed the advice, the unanimous advice of his ch Joint Chiefs of Staff and invaded Cuba, our troops would have been decimated on the beachhead by those tactical nuclear weapons, and the general nuclear war would surely have followed. We missed it just by that much. Even not knowing that, Kennedy said he thought it was one chance in three of that crisis erupting into a nuclear holocaust. Give, in fact, there's another related question. Given all the power that hindsight has to offer, and I know your feelings on this, is it fair to say that, that successfully avoiding disaster during the new Cuban Missile Crisis was a fluke and what was the most valuable lesson learned from navigating that crisis successfully? I would not say it was a fluke. I'd say both President Kennedy and President Khrushchev did everything within their power to prevent a nuclear catastrophe. In spite of that, we almost blundered into one. And the chances, some say one in three, some say one in two. My view, the way I would put it is we avoided it. We, we had good management, but we avoided the catastrophe more by good luck than by good management. Okay, um, another, another one. Uh, what is China's position as a threat or agent for disarmament? Well, China is certainly an economic competitor and a technological competitor. It would be an extreme absurdity if our two countries ended up in a war. It would be catastrophic for both countries. I don't see that happening. But the danger, of course, is not that our two countries would plan such a war, which I don't think is in hand by either country, but again, that we'd blunder into one. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I know I want to include this because I know a lot of people will have this question. Could you speak about the Trump's tweets at the North Korean leader and what effect that may have among the leadership in North Korea? Actually, my big concern is that he will order a preemptive strike, which I think would be a disaster. Uh, my second concern is that he's, with his taunts and his rhetoric, <clears throat> he might stimulate Kim Jong-il to believe we're about to conduct a strike and that he might take the first strike. So it's dangerous. Um, given the asymmetric nuclear relationship between Iran and Korea versus the United States, how should the U.S. respond if either country were to launch an EMP attack on the U.S., which I assume means an electromagnetic pulse attack as a as a, uh, a nuclear weapon that explodes in the atmosphere will produce an incredible electromagnetic pulse which would which would destroy communication throughout the country. I have a hard time, almost an impossible time, imagining that happening. So I agree. really quite answer the question. Yeah, it, 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 as, as you pointed out, and I'll, I'll speak for you in this case, because uh, to give you time, but, but the, one of the things that I found about your nightmare scenario, pretty important, and, and one of the things that always amazes me, is how much effort and time and money is spent on considering nuclear weapons attacks from Korea or Iran, when if you send a ballistic missile, a high school student or an undergraduate, could, it's ballistic means it goes by the Newton's laws and you work backwards and there's a big X marked annihilation. Mm -hmm. Whereas putting a, a, a nuclear device in a cargo ship, you don't know where it's from, even if you're a country. And so I, I think the, the, the least plausible scenario in some sense is because the minute those countries were to do that, they risk certain annihilation. And I, I assume you would agree with I that. I agree. Um, um, okay, what, what, uh, what systems are in place to monitor the movement of nuclear material to keep it out of terrorist hands? 
Uh, the only thing we're doing that I think is effective at all was the work done under the Nuclear Security Summit, which is trying to keep uranium, enriched uranium, out of the hands of terrorists. And they made very good progress in doing that and it made us all safer as a result of that. But, but the job is not done. It's been a big improvement. And, and of course, you, I, 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 I says, it's a topic I skipped, but you did a huge amount, as you mentioned, when you were Secretary of Defense, that, that when the Soviet Union became Russia, suddenly various countries like the Ukraine became uh, like the third or fourth largest nuclear power in the world because there were thousands of nuclear weapons left over there. And, and, and while you were Secretary of Defense, uh, and see you and Sam Nunn and others uh, worked very hard, I guess, to... I did, and uh, I would say that it was done with complete cooperation with the Russians and Ukrainians. And we can't imagine that happening today, but then we dismantled 8,000 nuclear weapons in three years' time, 8,000 nuclear and weapons. And probably, probably, in my mind, um, one of the single most important bits of improving the safety and security of the country was doing that. Had we continued it, yes. Yeah. If we were to do away with the weapons that, uh, all the weapons, what would happen to the plutonium in places like Los Alamos? Namely, what would, how much, what would we need to do to get rid of the, uh, uh, people are always concerned about radioactive materials. And so you perhaps give a, an idea of, of how much it would, of what kind of environmental issue would be, would there be any? Um, you'd, you'd put it in, in uh, casts and bury it. And the reason that hasn't been really None of the reason people argue about doing it is you get what if, what if, would it last for a thousand years or 10,000 years or whatever? I don't know, but it'll last for a hundred years anyway, so you can solve the medium term problem if not the long term problem. And I don't know, I, I was also thinking in terms of nuclear waste compared to nuclear waste and nuclear reactors, what the actual amounts of, of, of weapons material would be. And I, I don't have the number offhand, I don't know if you, and the magnitude of, uh, if you were to dismantle all the nuclear weapons in the world, how much? uranium, plutonium, would that result in? I, I don't know the number. Many, many tons. Yeah, many tons. Thousands of tons. Yeah, okay. Um, here's a good question. I th well, they're all good questions. It seems like our defense industry, which is very profitable, is highly incentivized to promote a nuclear arms race. How should these incentives be countered? The military industrial complex, if you wish, that, I, that Eisenhower it, first talked about. All I can say is they never, it never influenced my decisions as the Secretary of Defense. And I think that's true of most secretaries of defense, that you can stand up to that if you choose to do it. Certainly yeah. they have their motivation is to promote more arms. And but they, they advertise. the secretary of defense, but, but don't they spend a lot of money lobbying Congress? Of course they do. And but again, here's the, here's the but on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say 95% of the money we spend on defense is money which was requested by the Defense Department. So there are egregious examples, counterexamples of that, but on a percentage basis, they're relatively small compared with almost any other country in the world. For all of our complaints, and there are many of them about the inefficiency of our defense industry and the susceptibility to pressure from Congress, this industry is relatively not corrupt. And most other defense industries in the world are corrupt. The difference is amazing. So we, one of the reasons we're a little bit comfortable in making decisions at a time is because the various provisions in place to prevent corruption are, are, pretty, are pretty effective and they slow you down. But uh, I would rather be slowed down than have a corrupt industry, which we see all over the world. Okay, that's, that's heartening. And, 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 uh, and uh, goes against the grain of what, much of what you hear, so that's interesting. Um, here, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Uh, do you consider the use of a nuclear weapon against the U.S. by some internal faction of our own government to be a plausible threat? Or I assume let's extend it to an internal faction within, within, uh, within the United States, an internal terrorist group. And it's not one of my nuclear nightmares. It'd be way down on the list. It's not impossible. It's way down on the list. Okay, I agree. Um, in, in, in a best case scenario, and this is an interesting question because it'll get us to this. In a, in a best case scenario where we launch 200 ICBMs and take down 200 inbound nuclear missiles, what is the environmental impact? Say it again. Well, more or less it's saying in a best case scenario where we launch 200 ICBMs 
And, and I think they, they, they misunderstood. They think the ICBMs take down t incoming missiles. It's not ICBMs, it's, it's other missiles. But let's, let, me, let me change it a little bit. And they say, and more or less say, in the best case scenario where 200 ICBMs are used in, 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 or exchanged between two sides, whatever two sides they are, what is the environmental impact? And, and, and it's something we've talked about before. And so I think it's important because yeah. people talk about limited nuclear war. We used to talk about so limited nuclear war. you're talking about war. the detonation of 200 ICBMs in the United States, another 200. Yeah, uh, well, in any country. Well, a small care. number of our total Yeah, war. yeah. And, and, you know, the point is that people talked about the limited nuclear war, and there is no such thing. Well, setting aside the tens of millions of people killed, yeah. which, is, which is, in a sense, an environmental impact. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it would have a profound effect on our climate. The uh, soot and the dust that would, first of all, go up into the atmosphere and then settle in the stratosphere. Most computer calculations that I've seen on that most mm -hmm. show that that could last for 10 years or so and could cause enough obscuration of the sun rays would be maybe a few degrees temperature drop. Uh, a few degrees average temperature drop around the planet would have a huge effect on, on, on uh, crops climate. So it would cause, probably cause widespread starvation. Yeah, then the, the calculations I know of have, have, have um, uh, simulated an a, a exchange of 100 nuclear weapons between India and Pakistan. So, you know, people in this country may say, okay, who cares? But um, because it's far away. Um, and and, and by, by detailed numerical simulations that couldn't have been done uh, years ago uh, by physicists, uh, have argued that, that that very effect would probably produce, kill a billion people around the world over 10 years by starvation. So there is no such thing as a limited nuclear war. Whatever, it, if, if it happens remotely, it's going to affect the globe no matter what. And I think that's really an important issue that people And you have to factor into that the social and the political and the economic impact of, of that. I mean, you're heading towards a Mad Max scenario, really, where the whole... Foundations of your civilization start to be called in question. In, in fact, actually, you said to me uh, earlier today, and I, was, I meant to bring it up, so I'm glad you did, that your nightmare scenario isn't on the beach, for those of you who are old enough to have seen that, or maybe um, Dr. Strangelove. It's Mad Max. And it, that's what you're most concerned about, is a civilization. The disruption of our civilization. And what's left over is not a civilization you'd want to live in. Okay, last question. Um, and I think it's an appropriate one. What can I do as an everyday citizen to help with the mission impossible of nuclear disarmament? Uh, two answers to that. First of all, get yourself educated on the issue. Most of you sitting in this room are not educated on that issue. It is, and that's the reason our representatives in Congress are not taking actions that could be useful here. You have to get yourself educated. And you say, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? Uh, well, I'm only one person. I can't do everything, but I can do something. So whatever it is I can do, I'm trying to do. It may not be very effective, but it makes me feel better <laughs> to, to be trying to do it in the face of such daunting problems. So get yourself educated. You cannot do anything by yourself. Associate with other groups to do it. You have, for example, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is a group of plowshares, organizations that are working to advance this cause. Join them, subscribe to them, contribute to them. Lots of things you can do in a small way. Again, you're only one person, and you can't do everything, but you can do something, and you ought to try. Absolutely. I want to echo that as a, as, as a great moral of this, that, that people matter, and that every time, as I said earlier, you're one per, per, person, but people together actually have an impact. It really matters. Con contacting your congressperson, if they get five calls in a day on a given subject, that is a huge, huge effect for them. Um, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, as I said, was happened during the Nixon administration. Why? Because scientists and citizens mobilized together, marching to end the, 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 the testing of, of uh, nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Um, the, it's happened during the Vietnam War. If, if you don't begin to act, I, I, I fear that nothing will happen. And so every one of the people in this room, and I hope everyone who's listening outside, will realize that you may be one person, but without your action, um, uh, 
the future will not be as good as it could be with your action. And I think that, let me just close by saying that, once again, it's a privilege for us at the Origins Project and partnering with wonderful groups like the Stanley Foundation and the Bulletin to hold these events because the purpose is to provide you with the tools you have to, to help make the world a better place. So thank you very much, and thank you so much to one thank of the most amazing people I've ever